questions, Jibreel answers those questions for the Prophet ﷺ rapidly. Not just any questions. Hussein ibn Salam, the chief rabbi in Medina, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ with some questions. When he asked the Prophet ﷺ these questions, the Prophet ﷺ responded, خَبَرَنِي بِهِنَّ أَنِفًا Jibreel. Jibreel just gave me the answers. Which is why Allah tested the Messenger ﷺ with what? In Surah Al-Kahf. To teach him to say, Allah. When Allah wills, because the Prophet ﷺ became accustomed to getting asked the question, Jibreel gives him the answer. So the Prophet ﷺ was taught that it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, in this regard, uh, Hadith Jibreel. When I told uh, my mashayikh, when I told my teachers that I was going to teach Jibreel, they were like, oh, mashallah, Hadith Jibreel. I'm like, no, Jibreel. Like, Seerah Jibreel. They're like, Who t- what are you talking about? There's no book. There's, what are you, why would you teach the Seerah of Jibreel? I'm like, well, it's different. Because Hadith Jibreel is the first hadith you learn when you study. It really is. It's the most important hadith in Islam. It is by consensus of the scholars, the most important hadith of Islam. It's been narrated by multiple companions with greater context from some of the narrations. The most detailed one is from Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Dhar says, we used to sit with the Messenger sallallahu and when someone came from outside, they didn't know who amongst us was the Prophet of God. Why? He dressed like we dressed. He sat on the ground like we sat on the ground. He distinguished himself only by his manners. Even when the Prophet ﷺ did the hijrah, when he migrated to Medina, the Ansar didn't know which one was the Prophet ﷺ. Was it him or Abu Bakr? So they're just waiting to see some form of indication as to which one's the Prophet ﷺ. So Abu Bakr took something, a cloth, and he did this. So they all charged the Prophet ﷺ. They didn't know who, how, who he was when they came. So outsiders would come expecting to see this powerful man, right? that's sitting on a throne while everyone else sits on the ground. They just saw him sitting with everyone else on the ground. So Abu Dhar says, we insisted the Prophet ﷺ sits on a chair. He refused. Then Abu Dhar says, what we did instead was we pushed the dirt together until we made a mound so that he's still sitting on the ground. But at least when someone comes from outside, they know who he is. He said, the Prophet ﷺ accepted that. When we did that, Abu Dhar says, one day we were sitting and he said, we used to wait for people to come to ask the Prophet some questions that we were too shy to ask him and we would listen to the answers. So one day we're sitting and suddenly a man appears. And this is how he describes him. He says his thobe was extremely white, not wrinkled. And you know, having an extremely white thobe while walking in the desert of Arabia is a pretty tough task. Okay, no wrinkles, no dirt on it. His hair was exceedingly black. And he said that he smelled amazing. He had the best smell that we'd ever seen. And he said the most perplexing thing about this man, he wasn't a resident because he didn't live amongst us, but he had no signs of travel on him. I mean, he he looked as fresh as they come. You know, they didn't have first class travel back then. You don't get off a plane and look fresh if you come off of first class and look miserable if you come off of coach, right? This is the desert of Arabia. So like, we're looking at this guy, no bags under his eyes. He He looks really, really clean really, really good, and we have no idea who he is, and Abu Dhar says he resembled Dihya. So it shows you that he didn't look exactly like Dihya from close up. He wasn't Dihya, he resembled Dihya. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So then Abu Dhar says, the man came and he stopped at the entrance. And he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Assalamu alayka ya Muhammad, peace be on to you, O Muhammad. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Wa alaykum as salam. He said, Adnu ya Muhammad. Do I have permission to come close to you, O Muhammad? The Prophet said, sure. Now, they weren't used to this as well because most of the people that came and asked the Prophet questions were Bedouins. They didn't have any, they just walked right in, sat in front of the Prophet and started asking him questions. So the adab was also flawless, the manners, like, Adnu ya Muhammad, should I come close? The Prophet said, yes. Jibreel came close. He said, should I come closer? The Prophet said, yes. Until Jibreel was sitting right in front of the Prophet and he put his hands on the knees of the Prophet. Abu Dhar says the Sahaba huddled around. What's going to happen here? What's he going to ask? So, the, so Jibreel says to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni an al-Islam. Oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ gives him the five pillars of Islam, that you bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah, that you establish the prayer, that you pay the zakat, that you fast Ramadan, and do hajj if you're capable of doing hajj. Okay? Now here's the thing. The man says, Sadaqt. You've told the truth. Abu Dhar says, we all looked around at each other. وَأَنْكَرْنَا Like we were like, who do you think you are to say sadaq to the Prophet ﷺ? You've told the truth. What is the arrogance? Like we thought this man had good manners, right? He says to the Prophet ﷺ, you're right, you've told the truth. Then he says, أَخْبِرْنِي al iman." Tell me about faith. 
the Prophet ﷺ said, to believe in Allah, to believe in the angels, SubhanAllah, it's Jibreel sitting in front of him, to believe in the messengers, the messages, the day of judgment and divine decree. He says, Sadaqt, you've told the truth. He said, Akhbirni an ihsan Tell me about excellence. The Prophet ﷺ said, تَرَى, that you worship Allah as if you can worship Him. And when you realize, or as if you can see Him, you worship Allah as if you can see Him. And when you realize you can't see Him, then you know that He sees you. He says, Sadaqt. Then he asked the Prophet ﷺ the frequently most asked question in the seerah. Mata sa'a? Akhbirni an sa'a? When is the hour? This is the frequently most asked question to the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone wanted to know when the Day of Judgment was. Not, not, because, not the same reason that Idris wanted to know when he would die. right? They just wanted, the mushrikeen, the disbelievers would ask the Prophet ﷺ mockingly but with a hint of truth like when's the Day of Judgment? When are we going to die? Right? So Bedouins would interrupt the Prophet ﷺ sometimes even in his khutbah and ask the Prophet ﷺ, Mata sa'a? When is the hour? And the Prophet ﷺ, he always gave a productive answer. So he would say in one narration, Mada addatu laha? What have you prepared for it? Another narration, Mada qaddamtu laha? The same thing, what have you put forth for it? Another narration, he said, look, by the time your son has gray hair, you would have already faced your resurrection. So even if the day of judgment doesn't come, death will already come to you. Your resurrection has started as far as you're concerned anyway. But when Jibreel asked him that, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He put his head down. So Abu Dhar says we were confused. To make it even more confusing, he said, Ya Muhammad, Akhbirni an sa'a tell me about the hour. The Prophet ﷺ said nothing. He asked him a third time, tell me about the hour. Look at the answer of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, the one who is asking knows very well that the one who's being asked knows no better than the one who's asking. Like you and I both know that we have no idea when the hour is. You don't know and I don't know. I don't even know why you're asking me that question. And it was to show the companion something, right? So then Jibreel said, well tell me about its ashra, tell me about its signs. And the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned two particular signs of corruption, that a woman would give birth to her master, and barefoot Bedouins would start competing to build tall buildings. And he said, Sadaqt, you've told the truth. Abu Dhar, and in the narration of Umar as well, he said that the man suddenly left so quickly, that we were all confused. And the Prophet ﷺ said, go see if you can find him. So all the Sahaba went around looking for him. They took their horses everywhere trying to find him. And they came back to the Prophet ﷺ. They said, he's nowhere. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you know who that was? They said, no. He said, that was Jibreel coming to teach you your religion. Even the wording of the Prophet ﷺ. He wasn't coming to teach me. He was coming to teach you. Because he knows how you guys pay attention when questions are being asked. And so he asked the most important and essential questions. And he succeeded because it's the most successful. It's the most important hadith in Islam. It is the foundations of our faith, the foundations of our religion, our creed. Everything is highlighted in that one incident, subhanAllah. So that's one way that the Prophet uh, was came to. Now what are some, now how does Jibreel act throughout the seerah? How does he come to the Prophet through the seerah? Okay, let's start off in Mecca. The role that he plays with the Prophet in supporting him and helping him cannot be exaggerated. I mean subhanAllah, it, you can't overstate it. It's it's so important, it's crucial. Not only is he with the Prophet ﷺ in his low points, he's with him in his high points. You know, when Umar ibn Khattab عنه, became Muslim, Ibn Mas'ud عنه, says, the day of the Islam of Umar was a victory for the Muslims. Why? Because when Umar became Muslim, suddenly they were able to do what? Publicly declare their, their, their Islam. Before Umar, no one could publicly declare their Islam. It was the first protest, the first time they walked out and said that they are Muslim. So they celebrated that day. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Lama aslama Umar." When Umar became Muslim, Atani Jibril. Jibril came to me and he said, "Ya Muhammad, laqad istabshara ahlu samai bi Islami Umar." He said, "Oh Muhammad, the angels right now, the inhabitants of the heavens, are celebrating the Islam of Umar." Subhanallah. So he's with him in his high points. How about his low points? He's with the Prophet ﷺ. In every single incident, that, in every single hardship the Prophet ﷺ goes through. For example, Abu Jahal says that if this man puts his face in the dirt again in front of us, in front of the Kaaba, he swore by Allah wal Uzza, he swore by the idols that I'm going to step on his neck and I'm going to kill him. I'll do away with him. It'll be the end of Muhammad ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ, he comes out, he starts to pray in front of the Kaaba. Abu Jahl starts walking towards the Prophet ﷺ. Suddenly he puts his hands on his face, he screams and he runs. And they asked Abu Jahl what happened. He said, the ditch of fire. And he started saying these things like, there is something between me and him. When the Prophet ﷺ finished his salah, the companions came to him. They said, what happened? He said, لَوْ فَعَلَهُ لَأَخَذَهُ جِبْرِيلٌ 
He said, if he would have tried that, Jibreel would have killed him. <laughs> like I know Jibreel is there and Jibreel would have done away with Abu Jahl. But it's also emotional support. And not only did Jibreel come to support the Prophet emotionally, he also supported his family. Remember Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha? The Prophet during the boycott, when they were living in those harsh circumstances, they lost everything. Khadija lost her money, he lost his money, they've lost their, you know, their status, they're being, they're being uh, ridiculed in society, their, you know, food is not reaching them properly, they barely are surviving. And Khadija is an older woman at that point as well. And Jibreel enters upon the Prophet as Khadija is making whatever food that she has. And Jibreel says, Havihi Khadija. That's Khadija. He's, ta- like the pro- he's telling the Prophet that's Khadija. He said, she's about to come to you with that tray of food. When she does, give her salam from Allah. And give her my salam. وَمِنِّ salam. Give her my salam as well. And give her the glad tidings of a home in Jannah that is made of qasab. It's made of pearls and there is no, there, there's not going to be any noise or exhaustion or fatigue there. Meaning let her know that she's about to have a place in Jannah that far outdoes anything that she's sacrificed in this world. So the Prophet ﷺ, when Khadija comes, the Prophet ﷺ says, هذا جبريل. Here is Jibreel. Gives you salam from Allah. And he gives you salam from himself. And he gives you the glad tidings of a home in paradise made of pearls and there is no fatigue, no noise therein whatsoever. Khadija radiallahu anha demonstrating her spiritual maturity. She says, as for Allah, who is salam? Allah is peace. As for Jibreel, wa alayhi salam. And peace be on to him. And she said, inshaAllah, we will be patient. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she died after that. She died shortly after that incident took place. And the Prophet obviously was devastated. And when Abu Talib died as well now, obviously the Prophet ﷺ now was ridiculed far harsher and he was hit far harsher. And subhanAllah, there is a narration from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this narration, the, the sanad is disputable, but the scholars, the chain is disputable, but the scholars still use it to show that incident, what was happening during the muqata'ah, during the boycott. That once the Prophet ﷺ was hit in the face and there was blood running down his face. This was just a random time. Someone hit him with an object and blood was running down his face. And the Prophet ﷺ, he just sat down grieving. So Jibreel came to him. And Jibreel said to him, Ya Muhammad Malik, what's wrong? And he said, look at what my people are doing to me. And Jibreel alayhi salam says, do you want me to show you an ayah? Do you want me to show you a sign? The Prophet ﷺ said, sure. He said, ud'u tilka shajara. Call that tree to come towards you. Now you might be thinking, yeah, whatever, trees moving, tree. Do you realize that over a hundred companions narrated the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ used to give khutbah leaning on a tree? And when we built him a manbar, when we built him a pulpit, and he went to that pulpit, the tree started to cry and shake. And the Prophet ﷺ went to it and comforted it until it stopped crying. <laughs> Those things happen to the Prophet ﷺ. Or how about the tree that is in the middle of nowhere on the outskirts of Jordan, in the middle of this desert, full, its branches are still full. It looks like, subhanAllah, it's as full as they come, it's green as they come, and there is nothing around it. Everything around it has, has died. And that was the tree that the Prophet ﷺ rested under when he went to Asham, when he went to that area. So here, when Jibreel tells the Prophet ﷺ, look, tell that tree to come towards you. It's nothing new. The Prophet ﷺ, he calls the tree and the tree comes to him. Jibreel says, now tell it to go back. The Prophet ﷺ tells it to go back. Jibreel says, Radit. <laughs> Are you happy? Are you pleased now? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hasbi. Yes, that's enough. Right? So Jibreel is coming to the Prophet ﷺ and he's reassuring him. Now, what's fascinating here and remarkable here is that Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ at his lowest moment and then his highest moment. What was the worst moment of the Prophet Sallallahu life? What was the worst day of his life? In his own words, the last day of Ta'if, after two weeks of being humiliated, after two weeks of being rejected in the worst possible way, mocked and slandered, he's made to walk for 30 kilometers, that's 18 miles, about 18 miles, through a narrow row of people, children, and, and subhanAllah, people that had mental issues, and they were hitting the Prophet Sallallahu cursing him, and the blood was running down his body, and the stones were in his sandals, and the Prophet ﷺ was in the middle of nowhere. He didn't even know where he was after that. And he calls Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who does Allah send? Jibreel. Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ, and he has with him 
Malakul Jibal, an angel that can move mountains. And Jibreel says, Ya Muhammad, we have heard your complaint. And he says, with me is an angel, Malakul Jibal, an angel that can move these mountains. The angel says, Assalamu alaikum Ya Rasulullah, peace be unto you, O Messenger of Allah. And he says, you tell me what you want me to do. And he starts to suggest to him, he said, if you want, I can take Al-Akhshabain. The two mountains that are on, you know, if any of you have ever been to Hajj or Umrah, you know where Ajiyad is. That's where one mountain is, the other one on the other side of Ta'if. He said, I'll crush them all. I'll do away with them all. Whatever you tell me to do. The Prophet ﷺ said, even in that moment, he said, no, because maybe there will be from their children, people that will worship none but Allah. Maybe their children will be different. The children that just stoned him, subhanAllah, and hit him, maybe their children will be different. And as a result, Allah gifted the Prophet ﷺ with what? The children of his enemies. Abu Jahr's son, Ikrama, right? Uh, Al-Walid ibn Mughira, his son Khalid. Al-As, his son Amr, radiallahu anhum ajma'een. The greatest, some of the greatest companions, their fathers, were the greatest enemies of the Prophet ﷺ. Allah gifted the Prophet ﷺ with those people because the Prophet ﷺ never lost hope in his people. So that was the lowest moment of, of the Prophet ﷺ's life. That was what he called the worst day of his life. Now here's the thing, Allah says, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يسرى. With hardship comes ease. Right after the lowest moment of his life, Rasulullah says, while I was sleeping, Atani Jibreel fi khudrin mu'allaqin bihidur. Jibreel came to me wearing green garments with rubies hanging down, with rubies hanging from those green garments. And these this is Libasul Jannah, the clothes of the people of paradise. So Jibreel came and it was clearly different. And he said, Once again, Jibreel opened my chest, he took my heart, he put it into a vessel of Zamzam. And he poured into it al-iman wal-hikmah, more faith and more wisdom, increasing the Prophet ﷺ, renewing the Prophet ﷺ. This time the Prophet ﷺ knows what's happening and he put his heart back and he sewed it up again. And Jibreel ﷺ told the Prophet ﷺ to mount al-buraq. There was a particular animal, al-buraq, and there is no animal like that animal that we see. And subhanAllah, Al-Qadi Ayyad, he narrates that Al-Buraq was shy of the Prophet ﷺ. And Jibreel told Al-Buraq, look, there is no greater person that has ever mounted you than this man. Accept it. And the Prophet ﷺ, he mounted Al-Buraq and Jibreel took him somewhere. Where did Jibreel take him? Before Al-Aqsa. Took him to Medina. Okay, this is actually a long hadith in Al-Nasai. The Prophet ﷺ says, we got to a place and Jibreel told me to descend and to pray. So I descended and I prayed. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel said to me, Do you know where you've prayed? I said, No. He said, This is Tayyiba. This is the pure land. Why did he say Tayyiba? Because the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if because he saw this land with greenery and palm trees. And he thought that was Ta'if. It could either be Ta'if or Medina. They look exactly alike. They have the same climate. Ta'if made more sense to the Prophet ﷺ because it was right next to him and it had greater people in terms of status and lineage. And Jibreel is telling him, this is where you were supposed to go, and this is the land of your hijrah. This is where your hijrah is going to be to. This is where you're going to migrate to. Then the Prophet ﷺ mounted again, and he was told to dismount and pray. And Jibreel told him, do you know where you've prayed? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. He said, this is At-Tur, the place where Allah spoke directly to Moses, to Musa salam, Which is a sign of what? That this is about to happen to you too. Then he told them to mount once again, and they reached another land, dismount and pray. The Prophet ﷺ said that he asked me, do you know where you've prayed? I said, no. He said, this is Bethlehem, the place where Isa ﷺ was born. Jesus, peace be upon him, was born. Which is a sign that this is a continuation of his message. Then he said, finally, we arrived at Al-Aqsa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberated, Allahumma ameen. We arrived at Al-Aqsa, the place where Ibn Abbas anhu says, there isn't a single space there, not a handspan, except that an angel or a prophet has prayed there. Not a single handspan. And Rasulullah says, the anbiya were gathered for me. The Prophet I mean, this is a pretty amazing sight. He walks in and he sees the anbiya gathered in rows waiting for salah. And he says, Jibreel took me and he put me in the front and he said, Ya Rasulullah, lead them in salah. So he said, I led them in salah. Then Jibreel took my hand and we started to ascend. And he said, every time we got to one of the gates of the heavens, there was an angel at that gate of the heaven that said, Who is it? And he said, Jibreel. And he said, Man ma'ak? Who's with you? And he would say, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And the angel would say, Ursila ilayhi, has he been sent for? And Jibreel would say, Naam, yes. 
And the angel would say, Marhaban bin Nabi Salih. Welcome to you, O righteous Prophet. Welcome to this righteous Prophet. SubhanAllah, this is right after the rejection of Ta'if. The angels are welcoming him in the heavens. The prophets are welcoming him in the heavens. The Prophet said, we continue to ascend. Suddenly Jibreel alayhi salam, he had two glasses in his hand. One of wine and one of milk. Or one of milk and one of wine. Okay? One of milk and one of wine. And he presented them to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now is wine halal? What? Are you guys serious? I heard like 20 people just say yes. Is wine halal? Is wine halal? Are you sure? Okay, good, because I'm going to change the topic completely if you guys say wine is halal. And we're going to, we're going to have a fiqhi discussion right now as to what khamar is. Don't give me that grapes and non-grapes nonsense, all right? Wine is haram, okay? <laughs> but here's the thing. If Jibreel is presenting you wine, is it halal? All right, so if you see a dude outside named Jibreel and he's presenting you a glass of wine, <laughs> is it halal? Or is it haram? It's haram, right? Now for the Prophet ﷺ, was it halal? It's 110% zabiha, hand cut, halal, whatever, however you want to slice it. It's halal, all right? But did the Prophet ﷺ say, well, if it's Jibreel then I'm going to take that. No, he took the laban, he took the milk, and he drank the milk. Jibreel made a comment. Jibreel said, Alhamdulillahi hadaka lil fitra. All praises be to Allah who guided you to your natural goodness. Law akhast al khamr, gawat ummatuk. If you would have drank the wine, your nation would have gone astray. Meaning Jibreel was happy for us as an ummah that the Messenger ﷺ chose the pure drink. He chose purity. He chose what his fitrah led him to. And that was a good sign for the ummah of Rasulullah ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, we also saw on that day Al-Kawthar, the fountain that the Prophet ﷺ would serve his followers from on the day of judgment. And Rasulullah ﷺ, he asked Jibreel ﷺ, what is that? Jibreel said, this is the fountain that you will serve your followers from on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Then we continue to ascend and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa obviously met multiple prophets. He met numerous prophets starting with Adam alayhi salam, ending with Ibrahim alayhi salam. When he reached Ibrahim alayhi salam, he saw another site. He saw Al-Baytul Ma'mur. Al-Baytul Ma'mur, the frequently visited house. And he asked Jibreel, what is that? And he said, this is Al-Baytul Ma'mur. It's the equivalent of the Kaaba on earth where 70,000 angels enter every day and do tawaf, and they never return. So that's al-bayt al-ma'mur. The Prophet ﷺ obviously continued to ascend until they reached Sidrat al-Muntaha. And when they reached Sidrat al-Muntaha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what in the Qur'an? أَفَتُمَارُونَهُ عَلَى مَا يَرَى Are you questioning what the Prophet ﷺ saw? Alright, and he says, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ Nazlatan Ukhra. He saw him a second time. Who is Allah talking about? Jibreel. He saw him a second time. Aisha radiallahu anha was very, very harsh with anyone that tried to say otherwise. Okay? Nazlatan Ukhra, the second of two times, the only two times the Prophet would see Jibreel in his full form. Where at? Sidrat al Muntaha. When they reached the Lot tree. The Lot tree is the boundary of Jannah. And, and the rest of the heavens and the earth. Meaning what? No one goes beyond the Lot tree. No one goes beyond Sidrat al-Muntaha. And the Prophet Sallallahu this time looked at Jibreel Alayhi Salaam when they reached Sidrat al-Muntaha and once again sees him in his full form. This time he sees him from top to bottom. The first time he saw him, bottom to top, right? In his full form. The Prophet Sallallahu said that Sidrat al-Muntaha, describing it, he said the colors of that tree were indescribable, right? Now, here in Dallas, mashallah, we have a lot of places to scuba dive and snorkel. So we've seen the bottom of the ocean, right? Right? No, okay? <laughs> if you've ever been to the bottom of the ocean and you've seen the colors at the bottom of the ocean, are those colors describable? Are they? Not really, right? They're amazing. They're things that you've never seen before. Imagine Sidrat al Muntah. The Prophet said, Look, I can't describe to you the colors of that tree. But as the Prophet ﷺ continued to go forward and he reached Sidrat al-Muntaha now and they were walking through, he said, نَظَرْتُ إِلَى جِبْرِيل So I looked at Jibreel. Why? The entire journey goes like this. Jibreel, what's that? مَا هَذَا يَا جِبْرِيل مَا هَذَا يَا جِبْرِيل What's that? What's that? Who is that, Ya Jibreel? He said, but this time, نَظَرْتُ إِلَى جِبْرِيل فَإِذَا هُوَ كَالْحِرْسِ الْبَالِ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ He said Jibreel was like a flattened rug out of his awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was looking up and he was flattened. Meaning, subhanAllah, he was in complete awe. 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing the closeness that he had to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that point of Sidrat al Muntaha. And the Prophet entered and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him directly the same way he spoke to Musa alayhi salam, to Moses peace be upon him, and he gave him the same order that he gave to Musa alayhi salam to establish the prayer. And the Prophet وسلم, on his way down, and obviously I'm skipping some of the details of the Sa'ud and Mi'raj because of time. On his way down, the Prophet وسلم, said one more sight. One more sight that he saw. Rasulullah said, Ra'aytul Umam. Suddenly I saw nations of people. They were standing behind their prophets. Each prophet had one or two or three or four or hundred or whatever it is, had someone behind him. Right? And he said, There were actually some prophets that had no one behind them at all. I just saw all of these nations, all of these prophets with their nations behind them. He said, then suddenly I saw this huge nation. Now realize the Prophet ﷺ, at this point of his life has a very few, I mean, he has a very small amount of followers. It's not that many followers, right? This is before Medina, before the Hijrah. You're talking about, you know, a hundred something followers. <laughs> and the Prophet ﷺ said, I saw this huge nation and I asked Jibreel, I said, Jibreel, is that mine? Jibreel said, no. I said, Jibreel took me. And he turned me around and he said, I saw a nation that was far bigger than that one. It dwarfed that nation. And Jibreel said, Ha'ula ummatuk. That's your ummah. SubhanAllah, can you imagine if we were standing there that day when Jibreel showed the Prophet some billions of people and said, That's your ummah. <laughs> Those are the amount of people that you are going to have that are going to follow you. The Prophet said, Then we returned. And subhanAllah, the next day Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ, this time in his human form. And he came to Rasulullah ﷺ at the time of Dhuhr. The command of prayer has been given to him. So he came to him at the time of Dhuhr. And the Prophet ﷺ said, فَأَمَّنِي فَصَلَّيْتُ مَعَهِ He led me in prayer and I prayed behind him. And he came to me at Asr and did the same thing. Maghrib, Isha and Fajr and did the same thing. Then he came the next day at the end of those times and led me again. And then told me that the salah is between these two, that your window of time is between these two prayers. Each salah is to be prayed between those two timings that we pray together. And subhanAllah, it was, it was common knowledge amongst the companions actually. This is an interesting historical fact without going too far into it. That some of the companions thought the Prophet ﷺ led Jibreel in salah. And it became a point of contention. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz settled this debate in his home as the Khalifa. Because Urwa ibn Zubair was the one narrating all the ahadith. He said, اعلم ما تقول يا عروة. You better be sure of what you're saying, O Urwa. And Urwa went through all of the different chains of narration where the Prophet ﷺ said, جاءني فأمني. He came to me and he led me in salah. فصليت معه. The same way that Jibreel came and showed the Prophet ﷺ hajj and he did hajj with him, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he taught him the salah. Step by step, each and every single step of the prayer. And subhanAllah, the prayer would develop gradually over time, obviously. Right? When the Prophet ﷺ was praying towards Al-Aqsa for 18 months or so. And then they were switched towards Mecca. And Jibreel alayhi salam, he came to the Prophet salam, and the Prophet alayhi salam, he said, what happened to all the other, what, what happened to all the other prayers though? And Allah revealed what? وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِعِ إِمَانُكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to let your faith go to waste, your prayers go to waste. Now as a final note here before we break for Maghrib, just something very interesting here, very very cool that you might not have thought of. Do you ever mention Jibreel in your salah? Do you mention Jibreel in your salah? All right, let's go through the different ways that you could possibly mention Jibreel in your salah. When the Prophet ﷺ would start his prayer, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was asked, how did the Prophet ﷺ used to start his prayer? And she said that one of the things that he used to say, especially in his tahajjud, the Prophet ﷺ would say, Allahumma Rabba Jibreel wa Mikail wa Israfil, Fatir al Samawati wal Ard, Alim al Ghaibi wa Shahada, until the end of the dua. It's a long dua. You can find it in Fortress of the Muslim. In fact, if you go to Google and you search Lord of Jibreel, Mikal, and Israfil, you're only going to get two duas. All right, so just search it, okay? So the Prophet ﷺ would make a dua in the beginning of his salah, mentioning the Lord of Jibreel, Mikail, and Israfil. How about in Ruku' and in Sujood? Bowing and prostrating. This is interesting because we're about to go to Salah right now. So I want you guys to try to remember this. Do you mention Jibreel? In fact, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned Jibreel in every single Ruku' and in every single Sujood. Subuh, Quddus, Rabbul Malaikati, Warruh. So you glorify Allah, the Lord of the angels, and specifically 
Ar-Ruh, Jibreel alayhi salam. And Aisha says the Prophet alayhi salam never did ruku' or sujood except that he said it. Some of the scholars even considered it wajib. All right, it's a minor opinion, but that's how often the Prophet ﷺ used to say it. Some consider it even mandatory. What about in your tashahud? So we've covered starting the salah, rukur, sujood. What about in your tashahud when you're sitting down? Listen to this hadith. Abu Salama radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he says that the Prophet ﷺ, when, when he saw us after we were taught the prayer, he said, we used to say in our tashahud when we sat down, As-salamu ala Allah, As-salamu ala Jibreel, As-salamu ala Mikail. As-salamu ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa So they would send salam on Allah, Jibreel, Mikal, and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alright? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came to us and he said, As for Allah, who was salam? Allah is a salam. So instead say, At-tahiyyatu lillah wa salawatu wa tayyibat. There's, there's some uh, people that think that this was a conversation. There is actually no authentic narration about this being a conversation. It may have been or may not have been, but it's not really established in any hadith whatsoever. The Prophet ﷺ said, look, instead say, At-tahiyyatu lillah, greet Allah with your prayers, with your good deeds, and greet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other ways. You can't say, As-salamu ala Allah. And you can say, As-salamu alayka, ayyuha nabi So you send, you send salam on the Prophet ﷺ, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillah as-salihin. Peace be on to us and on the righteous servants of Allah. You know what's amazing? The Prophet ﷺ said, when you say, Ibadullah salihin the righteous servants of Allah, it will reach Jibreel, it will reach Mikail, it will reach all of the inhabitants of the heavens and all of the inhabitants of the earth who are righteous servants of Allah. So when you say, Ala Ibadullah salihin you're actually making dua for Jibreel as well. You're sending salam on Jibreel as well. Finally, when you finish your prayer, Aisha radiallahu anha says, and this is the second of the two du'as that the Prophet ﷺ used to say, Rabba Jibreel. The Prophet ﷺ would say, Allahumma Rabba Jibreel wa Mika'il wa Israfil, a'idhni min harri nar wa adhab al qabr. Protect me from the punishment of hellfire and the punishment, the heat of hellfire and the punishment of the grave. So there is actually a mention of Jibreel ﷺ in every part of our salah. And with that, inshallah, we'll break for salah. And when we come back, inshallah, it's the best part of class.